Okay. So, going into the final day of Boyd's. <laughs> the current leaders are the Boyd Boyd's with 640. I saw it, it's legitimate. It is actually 640 Boyd's. There was a lot of cheating involved, but they ended up with a simulation that looked like Boyd's and it has 640 elements. So I've had a number of requests from a number of groups to go over sort of everyone's various optimization strategies in class. So I don't wanna spoil the fun for the Friday people. So I'm not gonna do that today, but I'm thinking on Wednesday, we will start lecture with a discussion of people's optimization strategies. And that'll last as long as people are basically interested. If you wanna do that all day on Wednesday, that's fine. And then we'll start PID control on Friday. Um, because it, I've seen a ton of various strategies. So it, I think it would be very interesting to go over everyone's thoughts on this. Um, one of the strategies that, that is required to get up into these high numbers is overclocking the CPU, which a number of groups have figured out. So if anybody would like to, if anybody has a current number that they would like to turn up by overclocking the CPU and they want some help doing that, you're welcome to drop by lab and we can show you how to overclock the CPU. Um, any questions or comments from anyone before I get into stuff? As I mentioned last time, I thought that the timing of the semester is about right to spend a day brainstorming final project ideas. Um, some folks have ideas already, but a number of the groups that I've talked to are still kind of thinking about stuff and experience shows that a class-wide discussion just on ideas tends to be productive at about this time. I put a Canvas assignment up for your final project proposal in, it's due in like two-ish weeks. So as you move into fall break, hopefully a discussion like this will just give you something to ponder a little bit over fall break about how you might want to spend the last few weeks of the course. So I have a list here of a bunch of thoughts and I've, I've broken them sort of vaguely into categories. And I thought maybe we could start with discussing some of the flavors of projects that are most dissimilar from the lab exercises that we've done. And then we can discuss projects that are slightly more related. So one of the big categories that depending on your personality and your interests, some people find interesting and some people find tremendously boring is a uh, physics simulations of various sorts. These can be super fun, depending on the physics simulations that you do. Um, so for example, you might consider doing something like uh, a simulation of the lattice Boltzmann equations, which would allow for you to show fluid flow across the TFT. Some groups have done that in the past and it ends up looking really cool. So you could do something like that. You could do, have you heard of diffusion limited aggregation? equations. Okay, these are cool. So if you are into, if you are interested in fractals and fractal like structures, diffusion limited aggregation is the algorithm that well describes how things like, oh, on a frosty morning, when you look at your window and you see the ice crystals sort of climbing up the window, or maybe you look at your windshield and you see ice crystals forming and branching. It's an algorithm that describes the formation of those structures. And it's a relatively simple one to implement. And the, the visual output on the TFT display can be really cool and interesting. So this is an example of a diffusion limited aggregation center outgrowth. You can do interesting things though, like draw text to the screen, like your name and have the crystal structures form off of the text. So you can make neat sort of half scientific half artistic sorts of projects using equations like this one. Um, another one that sort of fits into that category is, what are they called? Uh, they are called uh, diffusion reaction equations. These are, let's see, let's see, yeah. So this is a set of couple differential equations that describe the diffusion of, um, you know, you put, you simulate splotches of chemical on some surface on, on a, another chemical substrate. 
And the set of coupled differential equations describes the diffusion of those, that collection of chemicals and the reaction of that chemical with the other substrate chemical into non-reactive chemicals. So it describes the evolution of a system, a chemical system that's very far from equilibrium towards equilibrium. And depending how you turn the knobs on these sets of coupled differential equations, you run this thing and all of a sudden you start seeing things like leopard spots or you change the parameters a little bit and suddenly tiger stripes pop out or giraffe patterns. So these are the set, it is this set of equations that people use to model things like um, animal coat formation. So it's kind of interesting. Alan Turing had a lot to do with the discovery of these, the investigation of these equations, incidentally, one of his many contributions. Um, but if you have this sort of interest in mathematics and differential equations and biology, you might get a real kick out of these sorts of equations. Um, there are other physics simulations that lead to really nice visual output. You could implement the algorithms that describe crystal formation, snowflake formation, and generate, uh, you could algorithmically generate snowflakes in the TFT display. That would be really cool. You could build a, um, people know the Mandelbrot set? Ooh, gosh. Let's do this. Uh, the Mandelbrot set. So those of you that take 5760 next semester, one of our labs in 5760 will be using the FPGA to calculate and render the Mandelbrot set on a VGA display. And then to build a user interface that allows for you to zoom into the edges of this set. So the Mandelbrot set is one of the most famous fractals in the world. It's been called the most beautiful structure in mathematics. I think it earns that title. Um, but what's interesting about it is the way that you generate this fractal is you run an iteration. So this 2D plane here, the range of this is in the X direction, minus two to one, and in the Y direction, minus one to one. You divide up that plane into each pixel on the TFT display would represent a point in that plane. And then for each of those points, you run a really simple iteration. You basically take the value of this point, represent it as a complex number, multiply it by itself, add a constant, take the output, do it again, and do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And you run this, I don't know, a thousand times. And then you ask yourself, is the value of this iteration going to infinity or is it staying finite? In the case that it's going to infinity, it is outside the Mandelbrot set and you color it one color. In the case that it stays finite, it's inside the Mandelbrot set and you draw it in a different color. The gradient here is illustrating how many iterations it took to determine that you were diverging to infinity. Turns out you can show that if the iteration ever assumes a value of two, you're never coming back, you're going to infinity. So this gradient is showing you how many iterations did it take to get the two, right? Which gives you this sort of glowing effect. What's interesting about this structure is you look at the edge of this and it looks rough, right? And it raises this question of, okay, how rough is it? The answer is infinitely rough, <laughs> infinitely rough. It is a infinitely rough edge, which means you can zoom in on the edge here and keep zooming and keep zooming forever. And you will keep finding structure and it's non-repeating. So you'll keep finding new structure as you zoom in. So a cool PIC32 project might be to take the 320 by 240 TFT display, represent the complex plane here, run this iteration for each pixel on the display and render the Mandelbrot set. And then you could build a user interface with buttons and switches and such that allows for you to zoom in on some part of the Mandelbrot set and explore it. It's infinitely rough, so there are infinite places that have not yet been explored in this set. There are some famous places. Um, the region between this main cardioid and the head here, that crack there in the top and the bottom is called Seahorse Valley for the reason that, let's see if they have a picture of Seahorse Valley. Yeah, here they're zooming in on Seahorse Valley. Um, as you zoom in, the structures look kind of like seahorses. So there are very famous regions of this set, and then there's an infinite amount of regions that are unexplored. And it's a very cool one to 
it's a cool one to just when it pops up on the screen, you go, oh my god, right? It's it's a very cool thing to calculate on your own. Um, a set of related fractals is called the Julius set, which you may also find interesting. Um, it's a very very similar set of it's a very similar iteration to that that generates the Mandelbrot set, but as you tweak parameters slightly, you can generate these Julia sets, which are also gorgeous, right? And also very complex. So you might make a Mandelbrot slash Julia set generator, which allows for you to render and explore the Mandelbrot set and then render these Julia sets and take a look at these as well. I love these kinds of projects. I think, you know, why do these things exist? I, it, <laughs> there's no reason that they have to exist. The, the stuff like this just feels like, I don't know, some sort of gift from the universe. It's fun to explore them. So the mathematically minded among you might be interested in that kind of thing. Um, other sorts of mathematical projects you might be interested. In. You might like cellular automata projects. People know about these cellular automata? So the most famous example of a cellular automata, I think probably is the game of life, which, People recognize this? So in the game of life, which was created by the mathematician Conway, um, what you do is, let's see, is there a good animation here? Eh, I think probably the best, the top one's the best. What you do is you take the 2D plane and you grid it up into a bunch of cells. And each of those cells is either dead or alive. And you color the dead ones one color and you color the alive ones the other color. You give it some set of random initial configurations of some are dead, some are alive. And then between frame updates, each cell looks at how many of its neighbors are dead and how many of its neighbors are alive. Its neighbors being the cells that are directly adjacent to it. And there's a series of very simple rules by which each cell will then, will then decide whether in the next generation it toggles from alive to dead or from dead to alive, or if it stays dead, or if it stays alive. And they're kind of supposed to model, you know, nature kind of. It's a little toy version of nature where, you know, if you have fewer than some number of neighbors, you die as if by underpopulation, you know. If you have more than, uh, or if you have between some range of neighbors, you stay alive. If you have more than some neighbors, you die, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that when you run this set of rules, it will generate, you can generate self-sustaining structures. So for example, people have figured out initial patterns to set up here. This is called a Gosper's glider gun. So if you set up the initial configurations here, this will, as you run the generations, generate these structures that propagate across, across the screen. They're called gliders. So there are some self-sustaining structures in Conway's Game of Life that move. There are others. You can set up initial configurations that the whole thing obliterates itself. There are some initial configurations that grow without bound. Um, so it's a really it's a really interesting thing to play with. Um, fascinatingly, it's also Turing complete. <laughs> you can build logic gates in Conway's Game of Life, and in fact, there's one. Gosh, I wish I could remember his name. But if you Google CPU implemented in Conway's Game of Life, you will find this person <laughs> who built an entire CPU in Conway's Game of Life. He figured out how to build you know, AND gates and OR gates and NOR gates, et cetera, and constructed a whole thing that is huge. And you turn it on, and it starts conducting an operation. But it all happens. It's a CPU where spatial distribu distribution matters, right? Because it takes. It matters how long it takes for things like gliders to propagate from one place to another place. Yeah. Within Game of Life? Yeah. I've seen that too. I've also seen people implement Game of Life within Game of Life. So it is it is a deep, deep rabbit hole, but it's a really fun one to play with. A cellular automata, this is an example of a cellular automata, which is a thing where it's a system where you grid up the plane and come up with a set of rules for deciding whether certain cells are on or off. Yeah. Question. So 
How many? So it does it look at the immediate cells around it, like the eight cells around it in the grid? It does. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, cells that are horizontally, vertically, or diagonally adjacent. So you could. I wonder how fast you could animate Conway's game of life at pixel level resolution on the TFT, where each pixel is a cell. Maybe that would be too small to even see what was going on. Maybe you need like four by four pixels or two by two pixels, I'm not sure. In any case, this, one, this one's really fun. Another fractal I love. The Barnsley fern. This is a Barnsley fern, which is, an algorithmically generated plant. So you run a certain set of rules here. You start at some position x, y on the plane, and then you probabilistically do one of the following four linear transformations to your position. So you, you know, flip a coin, so to speak, and, and you, you generate a random number. Depending on the value of that random other number, you move from where you are to somewhere else in the plane. And if you do this, for enough iterations with the right choice of parameters, you end up generating an almost perfect looking fern structure. You tweak the parameters a little bit, you get slightly different structures. So maybe you make a Barnsley fern generator and interactor where you can turn knobs and generate different kinds of ferns. Stuff like this that I look at this and think, I might be living in a simulation. I don't know. <laughs> really makes you think. Um, the Barnsley friend is very cool. If you like fractals too, you could do um, diamond square algorithm is another favorite of mine. So the diamond square algorithm is um, popular in computer graphics, particularly popular in video game development. And it's a method for algorithmically generating shockingly realistic looking landscapes. So what you do is you start with a square and with increasingly high resolution, you randomly set the depth or height of that element of the square. So you set the middle one at some elevation and then you look around the middle one and you move the elevations. And if you run this for long enough with high enough resolution, what you end up with are, let's see, fractal landscape, but we can get some pictures. You end up with uh, landscapes that, these are artificially colorized then. So what people do is you generate a terrain pattern and then you say, okay, anything below a certain elevation level, I'm gonna put water there which is basically just like put blue across. And within another one, maybe I put green to simulate forestry. And above a certain altitude, maybe I put white to simulate uh, snow or something. And you get these landscapes that look really real. Really, really real. Largely because of the fractal nature of their development. You're adding, you're adding elevation changes um, with increasing resolution. And you get these mountainscapes. Depending how you change the parameters, you could get the Appalachians or you could get the Rockies. You could get mountains that look different. More fractals, because I love them. L systems. This is another really cool one. L systems is an algorithm that allows for you to generate very realistic looking trees. So it's you start with some string that represents a set of of rules, rules being things like move forward this far, turn right, move forward again, turn right. And you then there are a set of rules by which you go into that string and change each operation to more operations. So you're sort of fractally adding length to the string. And depending on what the rules are, you get trees generated that look quite organic, actually. Um, these are, of course, artificially colorized, but you could implement some sort of artificial colorization on the TFT as well. But this is, these are some examples of L systems generated using slightly different parameter settings. And you can see you get you know, these sort of wheatgrass like structures coming out. Uh, 
Ah, okay, here's another good one. People, have people heard of the dragon curve? Anybody read Jurassic Park, the actual book? Oh, yeah. Okay, there's a picture at the start of each chapter oh, in Jurassic exactly. Park. Yes. The dragon curve is another fractal. You start with a certain pattern and then you repeat that pattern at increasingly high resolution and you end up generating this fractal structure that's called the dragon curve because it looks kind of dragony. So I like these aesthetic math, what would you call this? Aesthetic mathematics, maybe something like that. I like math that generates really pretty things. You might enjoy this stuff too. Um, let's see. There was another one I wanted to bring up. Well, it'll come to me. So other sorts of simulations you could do. Um, you, yeah, question? So I've, I like that channel and I've seen that video. So um, I believe the one that you're referring to is about shape filling curves, specifically the Hilbert curve. Hilbert curve. Yes, I did mean that. Which looks like this. Um, the Hilbert curve is a space filling curve, which is to say it's a line, a bendy line, but it's a bendy line that can fill the 2D plane. So it fills space. And one of the interesting applications of this is there was a group in last semester's class that implemented, used the Hilbert curve for specifically for a sight to sound project, which maps visual information to audio information. And the way that they did this is they considered a picture composed of pixels. It was a low resolution picture. I think it was like eight by eight pixels. Okay, so enough to draw maybe a smiley face or a frowny face or stuff like that. In any case, so they had this picture and then using the Hilbert curve, they would traverse each pixel in that picture and say, is this pixel on or off? So they were just drawing simple pictures with that were black and white basically. And then what you can do is take that Hilbert curve and stretch it out and map each location on the curve to a frequency and use direct digital synthesis, a bunch of direct digital synthesis gen, um, synthesizers all working together to synthesize the frequency of every pixel that is on. And when you do, so, so what that means is that there's a unique uh, set of frequencies being generated for each picture that could exist. And it is the case that with enough training, that's sufficient information for your brain to know what's in the picture. And this particular group last semester, the, the one guy that implemented this spent enough time working with it that he could close his eyes and you could make a picture on the screen and play it and he'd go, that's a smiley face. It's kind of spooky. And it's one of the, it was one of those projects that makes you think, because boy, would it be cool. You can imagine this for someone maybe who's like some, future version, some future thing to help like folks that have lost their sight or something. But is it possible to do something like wear a camera and earphones and walk around and translate the visual information from the camera into audio information? I don't know. I don't know if that's possible or not. I'm not sure. And there are other examples of space filling curves. So that one could be cool. Uh, you could do, let's see, you could do, um, ant search algorithm. I'm not sure if this Google search will bring up what I want. Yeah. Ant colony optimization algorithms. So you all are probably, you, you all probably know about these, but that's okay. Um, suppose you have an ant colony a bunch of ants sitting in a pile and there's a food source over there. The method by which that ant colony discovers that food source has been pretty well studied. And 
I'm, there's a lot of detail to it and I'm gonna oversimplify it, but essentially the way that this works is each ant is capable of leaving a pheromone trail that can be detected and followed by other ants, but it has a decay time. So if I drop a pheromone trail, it's gonna be gone in who knows how long. There's some decay time associated with it. So from the ant colony, there will be ants deployed that randomly search. And if you watch ants for a while, which is kind of weirdly fascinating to do, watch ants for a while, you'll see them do this. They just kind of randomly search. One will discover the food source and make its way back to the colony deploying a pheromone trail. Other ants will discover that pheromone trail and follow it and leave their own pheromone trail. And there's a positive feedback loop where the ants end up converging on a path that's usually close to optimal from the colony to the food source and back. It would be kind of cool to implement something like this on the TFT display where maybe instead of oids, it, instead of pixels representing voids, each pixel would represent an ant. And you could have the little ants explore to find a food source that you, the user, can place someplace and observe how this, uh, this ant colony optimization algorithm converges on a path to that food source. Ants can fall victim to this too, incidentally. Have you seen the ant ring of death? Oh. Um, it can sometimes be the case that suppose that pheromone trail accidentally ends up in a circle and then you end up with a bunch of ants creating a positive feedback loop pheromone trail, the colony will walk itself in a circle to death. Here's an example. Kind of dark. <laughs> um, so you might find that kind of thing cool. Um, it depends what your interests are. You, some of you might be really interested in, it's, it's rare that we have these projects, but the folks that do these sorts of projects, they often turn out quite, quite well. You could try to do something artistic. If, there, if there's an artistic, if, if some of you artistic are, oh my God, what am I saying? If some of you are artistically minded, you might enjoy the challenge of try to make something that people want to look at. That is a harder project than you realize. It's hard to make something that people want to look at. Try to make something gorgeous. Or here's a, here's a, a problem I've been puzzling over for a long time because I, I like art a lot and I like going to art museums a lot. Suppose that someone approached you, an electrical engineer, and said, hey, build something for an art museum. Not like to, you know, not lighting to shine on the art, not an electrical system, but build an exhibit for people to come look at next to the art in that museum. What would you, an electrical engineer, build that would be appropriate in that space? That's a hard, I don't know the answer to that question. But you could ponder that, and if you come up with an answer for you, try to build whatever that thing is. Um, for me, things in art museums have certain properties that are, it is difficult for me to see how to replicate those properties in an electrically engineered system. Um, for me, it is often the case, for example, well, I, I, I'm gonna go on a long tangent if I do that. In any case, ponder that for yourself and ask yourself, could I build something that would be appropriate in that kind of a space? And if you have some thoughts on it, then give it a go. That would be very cool. Um, some of you might be interested in, so what, one of the amazing things about electrical engineering, right, is it's an unbelievable vehicle for indulging interdisciplinary curiosities. So what I'm getting at here is ask yourself what your other curiosities are, figure out a way to explore them. Some of you might be really interested in history or in the history of computing or something like this. Um, I'm one of those people. I like the history of computing. You might consider doing something like, you could implement an Enigma machine on the PIC32. People know what the Enigma machine is. Yeah, getting a lot of nods. So um, there are not many of these actually left. There's one in the Spy Museum in DC, and I think there's one in the Computer Museum out in the Bay Area. Um, I tried to go see one in DC over the summer. I went specifically to go see this thing, but then it was closed, unfortunately. So I have to go back. But um, I find these things really interesting. As you all are aware, this is the 
encoding machine that was used in World War II, mostly by the German army, the Nazi army, and it was thought to be unbreakable. The code breakers at Fletchley Park and some other places, but Fletchley Park and Alan Turing was, you know, the, the, um, a prominent figure at that place, ultimately ended up breaking the Enigma machine using arguably one of the first computers ever, one that they built there called the Bumba. And if you really want to go down this rabbit hole, start doing research on the Bamba. No Bambas exist anymore, but the schematics exist. So if you take 5760, I'm trying to see how difficult it would be to build a Bamba on the FPGA. I would love to do that. I love the idea of a lab where I hand you an Enigma encoded message and you're done with the lab when you tell me what it says. I think that would be very cool. Um, but in any case, you could, you could implement the logic of the Enigma machine on the PIC32 so that you can enter a message. It returns the Enigma encoded message. You can change the configurations and type in the enciphered message and get out the plain text. That I will caution you is, so, so this because I thought about doing this for this class. I wanted to make it a lab for this class. The reason I ended up not making it a lab for this class is it's largely a coding exercise. So why do this on a microcontroller? I couldn't come up with a great argument for that, but if you wanted to do something like this for a final project, that would be fine. I would probably just ask that you put some like buttons and interact with it in a, a slightly sort of a way that makes sense with a microcontroller. Could do that. Um, there are other flavors of retro computing. You could try, people are obsessed with trying to get the video game Doom to run on different things. You could try to get Doom to run on the PIC32, play it on the TFT. I don't know how big that can of worms is. I've never tried that. Uh, but if you wanted to take that on, you could try to take that on. I, I believe all of the code has been recently, let's see, Doom code. GitHub, I think it's all online. Yeah, here it is with a letter from John Carmack himself. So there you go. If you wanna to try to port this code to the PIC32, that would be a hell of a project. What else could we do? Um, you could try to do some sort of sensory augmentation we have a particular set of senses, right? We can see stuff, hear stuff, feel stuff, smell stuff, that kind of thing. Could you add another sense? So for example, you might do something like, try to figure out a way to add magnetic sensing. I wanna be able to always know where North is. Add that to my list of senses. You could, a group in the past has done this by, they took a belt and implemented it with piezo buzzers and a magnetometer so they could measure where North was and the belt would vibrate in the direction of north. And that was cool because after a while of wearing this belt, they stopped noticing the buzzers, but just knew where north was. <laughs> kind of interesting. You might come up with other ways to do that kind of thing. What other ways could you, or what other senses could you add? Magnetic field's an obvious one. Um, I had a friend incidentally that became obsessed with this idea of sensory augmentation and got a magnet embedded in his fingertip underneath the skin so that he could put his hand near wires and detect if there was current running. That's a, a little extreme, right? But um, what other senses could you add? There are, if you're looking for inspiration in this direction, look around in biology. There are lots of animals that have sensing capabilities beyond those that we have. Um, it seems to be the case that birds can sense magnetic field, magnetic field, and that's, uh, they think that that's a, a, something that helps them migrate properly. You know where north is. Uh, I believe it's the case that cuttlefish can detect light polarity. If you look at the eyes of a cuttlefish, they're sort of W-shaped, the pupils. I believe, I might be wrong about this, but I believe that is to detect the polarity of light, which if you're living underwater, gives you some orientation information. Could you, well, that's a hard one. Think about it. Now, what senses could you augment? Um, 
okay, how about here's sort of a, a, a more low level one. Um, right now we program the PIC32 through the debugger, right? What, wouldn't it be cool if we could flash light at the PIC32 and get a new program on it? Or maybe um, hit it with sound of a certain variety and reprogram it or reprogram it through the radio. So the project here would be to write a bootloader, which would be a program that would live on the PIC32 and listen for some sort of sensor information. Maybe it's information from a light sensor or from a radio or from whatever it may be, right? And when it sees some signal, it would say, okay, I'm about to receive a program. And then every bit that it would receive, it would store in flash memory. And when it, when the end of the program was indicated, it would move the execution pointer to that place in flash to run the program that was just put on there. That one's hard. And that one's a little bit dangerous because probably you are going to be writing to flash in code, which boy, you can destroy a PIC32 really fast doing that. So you, re you really have to be careful with that one, but that would be really cool, I think. Um, this is something that is important in, if you're interested in swarm robotics, in building huge amounts of robots and getting them all to do something. For example, the kilobots. I'm sure you all know the kilobots. Uh, these things, which was, I believe, the first swarm of a thousand robots. There's a lot of robots here, right? So the, plugging each of these things in, in and programming it is almost, almost prohibitive. You, you, it almost takes too much time to make that practical. So I believe that the, way that the way that these were programmed was via flashing light. They could put the whole swarm under a light, flash a program onto it, and then all the robots would have the same program. I think that's the case. You could double check me on that. But in any case, there was some bootloader on there that allowed for them to program it through light. Bootloader would be cool. Um, on the, the topic of sort of sensory augmentation, you also might do things like biosensing. We can get you electrodes. So you could do things like put electrodes on your forearms. Turns out it's pretty easy to detect the electrical signal of fingers doing this. So if you put electrodes here with some filtering and with an op-amp circuit, you can detect each finger movement. So you could wear an electrode and build a little robotic hand that sits over here. And when you go like this, the hand goes like this. That'd be kind of cool. Your eyes are pretty strong magnetic dipoles. So if you put electrodes here on your temples, you can detect the movement of your eyes pretty well. So could you make some sort of electrode-based eye tracker? And how well could you get that to work so that as I look around, it's measuring the change in magnetic field from my eyeballs. And I could maybe move a cursor on a screen or something like that. And maybe blink to click. That would be um, let's see, you could do, oh, spectrogram images. So we all know what spectrograms are at this point. There are people, there are people who generate sounds so that if they look at the spectrogram of the sound generated, you get a picture out. God. So so you could do this though. So maybe you make a whole bunch of direct digital synthesis synthesizers, which allows for you to perfectly generate some number of frequencies. And then you can, so on the spectrogram, a direct digital synthesis synthesizer will allow for you to draw a trace across the screen. You could implement a bunch of them, which allows for you to draw a bunch of lines on a spectrogram and try to do things like write your name in cursive. What does your name in cursive sound like? You can figure that out. It's hard to You could do video games are very popular. You do any kind of game. Video games make good projects too because um, you play them as you build them. 
So they're highly motivating. And it really makes you want to optimize because it makes the playing experience better. So we've had people do the Google Dino game when you network connectivity out. They got the bitmaps of the dinos so that everything looked exactly like the game and the little cactuses and stuff and the birds. Um, you could do sound localization. Sound is slow enough and the PIC32 is fast enough that if you have a couple of microphones, a handful of microphones, you can measure the delay of receiving a sound from one microphone to the next microphone. So you could have your device sitting over there and as someone's talking or if someone claps, you would be able to maybe turn something to point at them. You'd be able to tell where the sound was coming from. That could be kind of interesting. You could do, it just had one, what was it? You could do head transfer functions. I think I've talked about these, right? So we have a two channel DAC. That means that you can put different sounds into left and right ears. Your head and shoulders and hair and the folds of your ears act like filters that warp sound waves as they come towards you. You can simulate that and put different sa differential sound into each ear to make it sound like there's something flying around the listener's head or like someone's playing a guitar in that corner of a small room. You can trick people like this. There's some, if you go on YouTube and look for head transfer functions and put on headphones, there's some really compelling demos of this. Those projects are tend to be really interesting. Um, all sorts of robotics projects are, are of course available. Um, little run around on the floor robots are possible. You could build things like plotters. You know, if you wanted to move a pen around on a piece of paper with servo or stepper motors or something. Um, I just got a whole bunch of these new little stepper motors that are cheap, they're like 13 bucks. The torque is wild. So if you want to, you know, do something torquey, I have some stepper motors that you could use. You could do a speech vocoder, something where you talk in, it filters your voice, warps it, and the sound comes out. You kind of you can make sort of robotic, sing-songy sorts of versions of your own voice. What do people think? Anyone else have any thoughts? So our TFT is not a touch TFT. I think in 5725, a touch TFT is used. You could, you could get one and use one for your final project. Or alternatively, they do make these resistive touch pads. Um, let me see here. I was experimenting with one of these. Uh, You could do something like, they make these pads that are, this is the pad here. And when you apply pressure to it, you read it through a couple of ADCs and you can tell where the pad is being touched, which allows for you to create something like a trackpad interface to a project. These are relatively simple to work with um, and would might allow, depending on what you're building, it might be a cool interface to your project. If you're building some sort of a video game, maybe it's nice to interact with it like this. Um, but if you're trying to add a touch element to your project, I'm just suggesting that that, that might be a way to do it. This, I showed some of you this already. Um, I know one group is thinking about an Etch-a-Sketch project. These are those two steppers, which are torquey enough to turn the knobs of an Etch-a-Sketch. This is drawing the butterfly curve um, on an Etch-a-Sketch. Another thing that you might consider visualizing for a final project, people know about the Lorenz curve, Lorenz equations. The Lorenz system is quite famous. You know, the butterfly effect comes from the butterfly curve. Um, but it is an, an example of a chaotic system. It's a set of three. Yeah, three coupled differential equations with these parameters, uh, rho, beta, and sigma, which are sort of knobs that you can turn. And 
thing and it'll generate these really gorgeous traces. These are a series of 2D projections. So this is the ZX projection. And then I think this animation rotates and shows you other projections. Um, so you could build something that integrates and visualizes the Lorenz system and maybe allows for you to change projections. Or you could do that anaglyph pro thing that we were talking about. Uh, anaglyph, is that, what it, is that the word? Is that what I'm looking for? Anaglyph. Anaglyph, yeah. Yeah, from like the old school 3D movies, right? Where if we had red cyan glasses on, this would appear to be 3D. So maybe you draw the Lorenz system, which is a 3D trace, and you actually render it twice, one in red and one in cyan, and get some $2 3D glasses. And maybe we could actually then see the, and maybe you slow down the trace so that it's being drawn at a pace that you can actually watch. And then you could watch the uh, system get traced out. That could be pretty awesome. You could, you could get deep into DMA weird stuff. You could, we, we talked a lot of, talked a little bit about DMA channels and why they might be useful. And DMA channels too, it turns out, just like Conway's Game of Life are Turing complete. So you could try to build little CPUs out of the DMA machines. Oh, that's getting low level. That could, that could be really interesting though. So give it some thought over break. And, and the way to think about this, as I've already said, is think about stuff you're interested in, think about stuff you're curious about perhaps, and then think about how could you use a microcontroller to explore this other curiosity. Interested in art? Try to figure out how to do something artistic, either on the TFT display screen or by moving some, some sort of artistic project. If you're interested in music, think maybe synthesizers or something that listens to music and responds as it listens. Dancing FFTs perhaps, spectrograms, that sort of thing. If you're interested in wildlife, there's lots of, there's all sorts of projects involving wildlife that you could do. You could build simulations of behavior like we did in Boyd's, you could do the ants. You could, there's other examples of things that you could do. Uh, you could generate animal calls. If you're interested in history, look at some old examples of computers, the Enigma machine. Uh, there's a whole, if you look up retro computing on Google, there's a whole community of people who are deeply interested in emulating old systems on new systems. You might consider doing something like that. If you are interested in becoming a cyborg, right? You might think about sensory augmentation. You might think about biosensing. Uh, we have to have a conversation if you wanna use electrodes. There are safe ways to do that and unsafe ways to do that. We just have to make sure you're being safe. Uh, if you are interested in riding bicycles, you might think about how could you augment your bicycle? What would make your bike better? Um, ponder it over brake. Ponder it over break. Think about what you're curious about, what you're interested in, and then think about ways to explore that interest.